the hell does the time go? I know I said this on the AEW one too, but I'm going to say here on the WWE one as well. I remember doing ups and downs for 2019, I ran them out 72 seconds ago, and now we're back. And we've got to do it for one of the hardest years in recent memory. But hey, that's my job, and that's what we're going to do. So just in case you are brand new to this, yes, my name is Simon Miller. It's What Culture Wrestling. We take this, it's like the finger of power, and we're going to give the good bits an up, and the bad bits are down for everything in WWE in 2020. And when I say everything, I mean a choice few things that I have pulled out. But say pulled out of my whim wham. We have gone off track. <laughs> Let's up those doubts. Right, most lists like this will start this way, but let's face it, not only WWE, but all of professional wrestling had a flipping rocky year in 2020. But really, when you go through it month by month, day by day, and week by week, they actually dealt with this very well, and very well indeed, and it's getting it up. But I'm not sure we could have said that when Triple H welcomed us to the performance center that time. You remember? He was in that weird pod thing in the air, and he was like, look what we're gonna do from our training center. But then, after that, we got the Boneyard match, we got the Firefly Funyard match, we got the greatest wrestling match ever, we got that awesome Intercontinental title tournament on SmackDown with no fans, but it still felt like it had atmosphere. Everybody pulled it out their ass, and what came out was joyous and gold. And I was really very, very impressed. So yeah, even with no crowd, we have still had so many memorable moments. So for all the ones I've just said, and other ones like Dragonoff versus Walter, well, it is just a round of applause. You could even say that some of the things we saw were up there with the best ever. And that blows my brain. When we do talk about all of these things, however, it means we need to talk about Seth Rollins versus Rey Mysterio in their I versus an I match. And I still don't really know what to think about it. But yes, in case you do not know, Seth Rollins took Rey Mysterio's face and he pushed it so hard into a steel stair, his eye popped out. And in terms of wrestling, why the hell not? Like, all you gotta do is get everyone involved to go, hey, I'd love for my watching device to fall out on the floor, and then you just gotta try and execute it, and you gotta try and pull it off. Creativity should never be stifled in sports entertainment. But, and this is a big but, I don't really think WWE dove into it in the way that they needed to. Now, the rumor was there were two ending shots. One, the ending that we did get, and two, one where you would see the eye <laughs> rolling around on the ground. And while that may have sucked, I kind of think you needed to do it because we were just in between a rock and a hard place here. Like, Ray was just going, ow, oh, my eye, my eye, and says, all like, Whoa, I'm throwing up, even though it was his flipping idea to begin with. I don't know. I, I kind of applaud it. And I'm also kind of still absolutely baffled. I don't know what I'm doing with my shoulders. But when you do remember that Buddy Murphy was also accepted into the Rey Mysterio family, even though he was a major reason for all of it, well, I think we gotta give it a down. A respectful down, but a down all the same. 2020 has been such a weird year too, cause you will not believe that it was within this 12 month period that we had that encounter between R-Truth, Brock Lesnar and Paul Heyman. <laughs> Wasn't it good though? You know it was. Up. Just go and watch it and it will remind you why wrestling rocks. It's even better because apparently Brock Lesnar had no idea about this, so all his reactions were real. And it also made me scratch my stupid bald head and go, why isn't WWE using our truth in this guy? It's like, I haven't, but I'm sure I could have put the 24-7 title in this list and given it a down, because it just goes round and round and round, never stops. Can we please next year use truth in this fashion? This segment will be good even in the year 3049. The back and forth was top notch though, and you know what? It made me happy, and sometimes that's all I need. As we are gonna get into a few talents who weren't given their due in 2020, let's start with a couple that were the Street Profits. Up. The only thing lacking was some real competition, but that's an issue with WWE tag team division, nothing the Street Profits can do. But not only have they circumvented the usual, oh no, you've been called up from NXT and now you're going to be buried into the ground, they finished the year as the SmackDown Tag Team Champions, and I think they've handled everything that's been thrown at them really damn well. Not that time when cups just fell from the ceiling, but that's just WWE. They also feel like they're in a great position for 2021, so let's not screw it up. So all of that does mean they took the pandemic era and they ran with it and maybe someone who did that better than everyone, especially when we were in the Deathly Performance Center, was Asuka. 
so she gets an up, or of course, the Oscar up. But honestly, when it was horribly quiet in that building, who was singing, who was running around making all the noise, who was being hilarious on commentary? It was the Empress of Tomorrow, and she was just so beloved by everyone that she rose her stock. And even then, she's underrated. This just sums up that woman. She is so damn good, and she probably always will be. Right, turning the corner a little bit, let's go all the way back to the start of the year, and I will tell you something I was very excited about, and that was the fact that John Morrison was returning to the WWE. I thought we were gonna get kind of a Drew McIntyre situation where he had gone away, learned all of this stuff, and come back a better performer. And while that was true, WWE just went, well, we're just gonna do the same thing that we did in 2011, which by my maths was nine years ago. Down. And I honestly think even with everything that's happened that John Morrison could be primed for a main event run and even some time as the WWE or Universal Champion. But putting him back with The Miz, again, just threw you into the past and we didn't need it. We've done it, we've seen it, and what did it really achieve? And ultimately it doesn't matter because he got a pretty damn awesome job months before a global pandemic hit. But as a massive wrestling nerd and a massive wrestling fan, this is what I wanted. I didn't get it, so I take my toys and I throw them out of the pram. And speaking of underused wrestlers, we have to bring in Kevin Owens. Now the end of his year was absolutely faboo because that feud with Roman Reigns was terrific. But does WWE not understand what they have with Kevin Owens? He can be the good guy, he can be the bad guy, he can be the guy in the middle, he can be the guy on the roof. He can do everything. Please just let him spread his wings. So for his usage, down. But I want him as world champion. That's what I want. You can laugh at me or you can disagree. That's what the internet is for. But when KO was universal champion first time around, he was never treated like the guy. And for the love of everything, can we please just experiment with him once as the guy. I mean, just see, because if you don't see, how else are you gonna know? Tying this right into the man who cost Kevin Owens that championship. Very sadly, when it comes to my dad Goldberg, we gotta give it a down. Now, yes, he is my father, and I personally enjoyed seeing him back, but you have to figure out how to use him, and I don't think there was a wrestling fan on the planet that wanted to see him squash The Fiend, wanted to see him squash Bray Wyatt. I mean, we just didn't need it. It was the same problems with Bray Wyatt just hitting us in the face again, and it's not Goldberg's fault. I don't know why people get so mad at Goldberg. Imagine this scenario, ring, ring, hi, Bill. Would you like millions of dollars? Sorry, would you like millions of dollars, pal? And would you like to become world champion? He's not gonna go, no, I don't wanna do it. Of course he's going to answer in the affirmative, and so would you. But at this stage of the game, he should be treated the same way as The Undertaker, just stuck in the middle of a card somewhere and bringing all of his magic. This really was a bit of a mistake. And talking of another dude who is just another dude and shouldn't just be another dude, and also needs to be found, Alistair Black. Where did he go? But he spent half the year waiting for someone to knock on his door. They then knocked on his door, and I guess he didn't appreciate who was at his door, so he was just taken off TV. Now, of course, this is because management has apparently soured on Alistair Black, but how do you sour on Alistair Black? I bet if you ate him, he'd taste nice and sweet. There's no sour here at all. Hopefully he's back in 2021 down. And just to double down on that, it's been the same with Mojo Rawley, who also is missing in action. Ricochet Keith Lee, ever since he debuted on Raw, Naomi. And Mustafa Ali, Mustafa Ali. I swear, he can be a main event player. So like Captain Jean-Luc Picard, can we please make it so? And on that note too, do you know what else happened in 2020, if you so can believe it? Eric Rowan, poor guy, had to reveal his big surprise was a giant mechanical spider. What a waste of my life, down. Right, that is enough negativity for now. The Undertaker's goodbye, I'm giving it up. Now there is a lot of hoo-ha surrounding this now, but you have to take it in the context as it was presented. WWE really didn't have a lot of options given what had happened throughout 2020, and I thought seeing him come out of Survivor Series and say, see ya, I'm not gonna be around for a while, well, it made me feel very, very sad in my eye sockets. And then there was other individuals moaning about how long the entrance is. Are you mad? That is all The Undertaker has been since day one, and it's what I want too. I want the entrance to last 72 hours, and then he can have a two minute match for all I care. And sure, he'll be back to do a proper goodbye as he gets inducted into the Hall of Fame, but surely a dude that has dedicated 30 of his life to one company deserves that. Point is, The Undertaker rocks you ain't gonna knock me off this pedestal. As did the Hurt Business, up. And I mean this with all the respect in the world, but when I found out that MVP was coming back to the WWE, I certainly got excited because that dude always rocks, 
but I didn't think he was going to be the leader of a new group that would become some of the best things we'd see all year. I mean, it's a mystery why WWE didn't use the same template when it came to retribution, and do not worry, we will get to it, but MVP has given something for Bobby Lashley to do, to kind of save the careers of Cedric Alexander and Shelton Benjamin, and I get super duper excited, because this little part of me here is hopeful that we use it as a jumping off board for Cedric to become an even bigger star. All of it has been wonderful, and it took three letters to do it, MVP. We also ended the year with them surrounded by gold, which looks great in photographs. More of this in 2021, please and thank you. In far more serious news though, it would be very tough to do a list like this and not mention Black Wednesday. Down. Of course, this was a 24 hour period where WWE released a hell of a lot of talent all at once during a global pandemic. And I won't remember them all, but EC3, Gallows and Anderson, Heath Slater, Rusev, Sarah Logan, No Way Jose, Mike and Maria Kanellis. And I get it too, some people weren't one of their company, they're allowed to do this, and that is true. But it was kind of hard to swallow when weeks later WWE announced their quarterly financials and it was the most profitable one ever. So what else can you say about it? It was not very cool. Talking about new things that did work though, the Thunderdome, giving it up. Now WWE dealt with all the craziness as best they can by moving into the Performance Center, but when they saw ratings starting to go down the toilet, they had to do something, and you really do have to give them a couple of thumbs up for creating the Thunderdome. I mean, what a cool structure and experience it is. It's also a wet dream for Vince McMahon, because now he has buttons backstage that he can both to get the booze and the cheers as and when he so wants. And I'm a little bit scared that maybe we still do this once fans are back in the arena. But I honestly mean this, I don't think WWE could have created something better than that. It saved the show in many ways. I mean, honestly, go back and watch WrestleMania from 2020 when there is just not one sound. It is so hard. Whereas now, every now and then, you kind of forget it's all being pulled by digital strings. There was a couple of other new things in 2020 which did not go the same way. And I'm going to push them together because they both suffered from the same problem. So Raw Underground and the group known as Retribution, they getting it down. Because the problem with both of them is that they weren't giving enough time. Like Raw Underground had no direction and no pathway and was just thrown out there and then killed. And Retribution arrived, they turned the lights on and off, said things like, we want to destroy WWE, and then signed flipping WWE contract. So this whole will give it three weeks and then can it has to stop. You probably have to give things at least a few months. I mean, not even Lars Sullivan, the great Lars Sullivan, that apparently WWE loves got more than that. It is well and truly baffling. On a completely random side note too, while wrestling is awesome and I love it, in the grand scheme of things, it is utterly irrelevant. Real life is far more, well, just important, I suppose. And Becky Lynch, the man, became the mum, and she gave birth to a child before the end of the year. So congratulations to her. Congratulations to Seth Rollins. You had that awesome moment on television between her and Oscar. Ha! Ah, made you feel all excited and happy. Give it up. And Edge came back too, and there were these Weird people in the crowd, I think they were called fans who were absolutely losing their minds. Also, you could describe this as one of the best WWE moments ever. Ever up. And the same can be said for Bailey and Sasha Banks. Where the hell during some of those months would WWE have been without these two? Up. They were responsible for keeping WWE TV entertaining and reminding us all that long-term storytelling is what it's all about. And when they finally had their big blow for Hell in a Cell, well, I think that was one of the best matches of the year. Sasha is also one of the best wrestlers around at the moment, period. And Bailey just embraced her new gimmick perfectly. She is one of my favorite characters on television. Together, they took all of that and became even better still. And finally, WWE allowed Sasha Banks to have a title reign that lasted longer than seven seconds. And hopefully now she can become a proper women's champion. Which is the same for Roman Reigns. I don't mean women's champion, but I mean making his mark, so he gets an up. And it's true for Drew McIntyre, and he gets it up too. And why did I do it like that? Well, it's simple. Drew McIntyre has taken the ball that he was given and become one of the best booked babyface champions in years. And Roman Reigns has gone the other way, finally sat everyone down and said, look, listen to some of my ideas, and I promise you I can do well and turned into the sociopath, absolutely nuts. I want to be at the head of the table, tribal chief. And just in case he is listening, Roman, I love you. You are my king. You are the best. I didn't say nine. They're both so utterly compelling, which was summed up when they did have a match at Survivor Series, and it felt like there was magic in the air, to the point that if you want to rerun it down the line, you absolutely can. And when you remember that they've already had a match at WrestleMania, e.g. WrestleMania 35, 
five, well, you could convince me that this was two different people, given how I felt about them then, and given how I feel about them now. The only thing that sucks is that there's been no fans to react to this, but if they keep upping their game in the way they're doing it, well, I am very excited about the future of World Wrestling Entertainment, and when was the last time we were able to say that? As a quick finisher out of nowhere too, I think that Randy Orton deserves an up as well. He has been, quite ironically, on fire. Because, you know, he set a flame to Bray Wyatt, so he's getting it up. And also, I giving one to Otis. I know that WWE bungled the money in the bank, but he has sports entertained me from day one till now. He's getting it up too. And there you have it, the ups and downs for WWE 2020. I know I would have forgotten loads, but that's so that you now can go into the comments and remind me and start upping and downing of your own. Now, like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Go check out whatculture.com. Go check us out on Twitter at WhatCultureWWE and watch more videos here on What Culture Wrestling. My name is Simon from What Culture. Thank you so much for just supporting me and joining in with me over 2020. I hope you're going to do the same for 2021. We've got a lot planned. I'll see you when I see ya.